Well, hello, happy Friday, and welcome to the Actual Tech Media Expert Series. Now, today's session is all about how to plan, monitor, manage, and control cloud costs. And this is a pretty timely discussion, really, because I'm guessing that a lot of you are deep in your plans for 2023. And as you look back at 2022, you may be looking at some potentially unexpectedly large bottom lines that were not what you had planned or hoped for way back in 2021 when you were making all of these plans. So let's say that you're looking ahead at 2023 and maybe you're thinking about expanding or enhancing your cloud environment. And maybe you're feeling a little bit nervous because you've heard all of those stories about ballooning costs and you're not sure how your team can avoid the risk. All of these potential issues, whether you're looking back at an already large bill or you're looking ahead and worrying about large bills, these are uncomfortable places to be in. And I get that. In fact, every time we run a webinar discussing any kind of cloud infrastructure, I think cost is probably the number one concern or question that we get back from all of you. And that's why I'm so excited that we have this expert series here today, because we're going to get some real time, real world advice from a top cloud expert who I will introduce in just a moment. But before we get into our very exciting discussion here today, I want to invite all of you first to relax, to settle in, grab that pre-webinar coffee, a tea, an eggnog, or if it's a festive kind of Friday, maybe you're already into the mulled wine, whatever you've got going, but let's just take a quick minute, run through some information together and say hello. My name is Jess Steinbach. I, I hope I've gotten to meet most of you before. I see some familiar names coming in, uh, and I'm excited for all of the new friends out in the audience today. I'm very happy to be with you on this, uh, I was going to say lovely, but I'll be honest, it's actually a very gloomy, snowy, gray morning for me. But at least it's Friday, and it is lovely just to be here with all of you. Now, in order for you to get the most out of our cloud-centric conversation here today, I'm going to zip through a few of these housekeeping things, and then we'll get on our way. First, I do want to draw your attention on over to the question section of your webinar console. Now, an expert series session is an incredible opportunity to chat directly with an expert. Yeah, so make sure you get those questions in. Now, if we don't get to your question today during our live session, I do wanna make sure that you know that your questions will still get answered. We'll follow up with you after we wrap. Uh, and hey, if you're already in that questions box, you're thinking about the, the future questions you wanna ask, getting uh, you know ramped up and ready to go, why not say hi, introduce yourself to the other awesome and inquisitive folks out there with you today in the audience. You can share some Friday cheer with the rest of the actual tech media community. Now, if any technical issues do come up today, if a slide isn't advancing or there's audio or video issues coming up, uh, first try a quick browser refresh. That's usually gonna do the trick, but if not, just shoot our team a message in the questions console and we will be there to help you out. Okay, well, it is not just fascinating content ahead of us today. We also have an exciting prize giveaway. We're going to get to that at the end of our webinar. We will be giving away a $300 Amazon gift card. So that'll give you a little jump start on any holiday shopping you've got to do this afternoon or this weekend. Now, of course, you must be in live attendance here at the Expert Series in order to qualify. All winners must meet the actual Tech Media prize terms and conditions. If you're not sure what those T's and C's are, no worries. I do not expect you to have those memorized. You can actually head on over into the handouts tab right there next to the questions tab, scroll down to the bottom and you will find the full prize terms and conditions there. Now, while you are in that handouts tab, I'm also going to encourage you to click around and explore some of the exciting resources that we have linked there. There's uh, information from each of our sponsors for today's session. Also, the Gorilla Guide Book Club. You can register for some future actual tech media webinars. Just lots of great stuff in that tab. So be sure to explore the handouts tab before we wrap up today. Okay, now before we jump into our actual discussion, I do want to take a moment to learn a little bit more about the awesome sponsors who have helped make this expert series possible. So today we are sponsored by Cloud Zero, Cisco, Duet, and Immersive Labs. And I want to tell you a little bit more about all of them. All right, so starting with Immersive Labs. If you guys, I don't know if you've checked this company out before, I think this is so cool. And I'm gonna encourage you to click on the link right there in the upper right-hand corner of your screen uh, and spend some time exploring their website today after we wrap up, of course. Immersive Labs is all about people-centric cyber resilience, uh, but at scale. 
Um, because as they say, and, and as we all know, a lot of cybersecurity is, well, it's about people. It's about your team. So Immersive Labs is going to allow you to improve your cyber resiliency by working through some of those real world challenges uh, that are actually relevant to your organization. And most importantly, to the individuals, to your team's specific roles. So they're not training for things that they don't need. They're training for the things that are actually going to affect them in, in a worst case scenario. So uh, this is a really cool tool. These simulations are also really reactive. They're quick and easy to set up so you can have the exercise you need within hours hours of a new threat going live super cool so click on the link on the slide spend some more time exploring after we wrap up today okay next up we're going to talk about cloud zero uh this is a tool that i think all of you should be exploring again after we wrap uh because cloud zero is is an incredible cloud cost intelligence platform. It's going to help you look at all the potential spends and how you can be more effective with your cloud budget. Now, they have this really easy to follow uh, tour that's actually linked here. If you click on that little link, and now it's in the bottom right hand uh, corner of your slide there. Uh, and it's really neat. It actually sort of asks you, what is the most important thing that you need in your, in your dis you know, discussion, in your research journey right now? So, for example, are you thinking about cost, uh, cost allocation uh, and tagging, Kubernetes cost visibility, optimization and reducing waste, all kinds of cool options. Uh, and you can kind of go through the tour, even just exploring the website, you're already tailoring uh, the information that you need towards what, what you're kind of looking for at your organization. So uh, do click on that link, open that tab, save that for later. And then when we close up shop today on this webinar, you can go spend a little more time with them. Okay, up next, let's talk about do it. Uh, I love this tagline, get cloud expertise on tap. Who doesn't want that? <laughs> Picturing like a beer keg full of cloud expertise. Uh, basically, do it can help you solve the most basic cloud issues all the way up to the really complex cloud challenges and obstacles. So you've got all the expert advice you could ever dream of available on call, on tap, whatever you need. Uh, basically, do it is kind of the one stop shop. So you get the technology, the expert advice and the ongoing support, the dream combo there. So scan that QR code uh, and go spend some time getting to know do it. All right, and our last sponsor that we're gonna talk about today, and this is Cisco Secure. Um, and specifically today, I really wanna talk about and what we're kind of pointing out on the screen here is the Cisco umbrella. So it's designed to help uh, you make innovative and modern security, uh, cybersecurity needs as, as simple and as easy as possible. So we all know that this stuff feel, is complicated and, and it is complicated, it absolutely is. We, you know, we talk about this all the time. If there was a, a one-stop shop, if there was one button that did all the things, uh, well, it, it, it probably isn't real. Um, so we're not talking about, you know, eliminating things. We're talking about making them as simple as you possibly can, reducing noise and extra energy wherever you can. So for a, a lot of people out there today, you know, if you're thinking about cloud environment, your big concern besides cost is security. And the Cisco umbrella is going to offer you a flexible cloud delivered security by combining multiple security functions into one solution. So that way your data protection can extend to all devices and remote users and distributed locations. Basically, they're going to make it easy to stay protected everywhere in just a few minutes. So connect with Cisco today. Start thinking about building your security and agility and resiliency, you know, all, all the best things, all the things that we're thinking about all the time. All right. Well, whew, that was a lot of good things already. We've gotten through. Uh, we did some initial webinar info. We met our innovative and exciting sponsors. Uh, and now I think it's about time that we introduce our expert speaker for today's session. Although I have to say, I think for most of you, uh, this person needs no introduction, somebody you already know and love. I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Howard Cohen, a creator of compelling content, technologist, author, and I must add, such an engaging conversationalist, storyteller, and speaker. Howard, it is always such a pleasure to chat with you. I know that we are all in for a treat today. Uh, so without any further ado, I will hand the mic right on over to you, Howard. Oh boy, Jess, just hang on a second. I need to call my contractor and have the door frames widened here. Thank <laughs> you for that. That was so nice. Um, hello, everybody, and, and thank you for joining us today to talk about how to plan, monitor, manage, and control cloud costs. As Jess said, I'm Howard Cohen. And of course, I skip right right past myself. I'm in there somewhere. There I am. Um, if you have any questions that we don't get around to answering today, I want you to feel free to email me at my email address there. And uh, 
be more than glad to answer your questions if I can. Okay, so any of you who have ever attended any of my presentations in the past um, know that I, as a writer, love to start every presentation with a word of the day. And today is no exception. Uh, the word of the day today is surprise. No, not the kind of happy surprise you're expecting to see under the tree in a couple of days. Um, these are nastier surprises. These are unwelcome surprises. And they have to do with cloud. So let's take a look. The two things people want most from cloud are agility and elasticity. Agility, the ability to make a change of decision as you need to and quickly act upon it, uh, to change course really rapidly to respond to opportunity or to solve problems or to pre prevent disasters. Uh, and elasticity, the ability to increase the amount of resource you're using or decrease it to balance out between performance and cost. So those are really um, the two biggest, broadest categories of what people look for in cloud. Yeah, okay. This manifests itself basically at the user. So here is a user and they're working on something and they suddenly realize that they're going to need more storage for this data project they're working on. So in the old days, we used to write up a purchase order, submit it to purchasing, have them go shop it and find one, order it. it, takes a couple of weeks to get in, another couple of weeks to get installed. And then finally, we have more storage. Today, they go to their self-service console and click request it. And they immediately have more storage. There it is right there. That's one of the beautiful things about cloud, instant, instant gratification. Uh, you go to your self-service portal, request what you want, and get it. That's fantastic. Now, this project only runs for a short time, and so, okay, we're done. We've archived all the results. Now it's time to return that extra storage resource that we requested and go on from there. Terrific. Okay. The next thing that happens is that your company receives an invoice from the cloud company. And that's okay, you know, you're expecting a, an invoice, and you're expecting that it's gonna be so much and so much, and uh, pretty much what you subscribe for in, in the first place. But in the very beginning of cloud, and even to this day for some people, those invoices come in and they are career altering, hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases, maybe even more depending on the size of your organization. And, the financial officer who receives that whopping big invoice kind of like blows a gasket and tries to figure out what the heck happened here. And the answer is that users forgot to return their resources. This is a consumption based model in cloud. So you only pay for what you use. Well, use is what the cloud considers that which you've requested, whether or not you're using it. So if you forget to return it, it just sits there idle and it costs you. The meter keeps running. And that in the beginning, especially, but even to this day in some cloud environments, that runs up huge, huge bills. Therein lies the surprise. Okay. And the chief financial officer is the first one to receive that surprise. And the end of that person's position in the company is the next nasty surprise. Um, it's a terrible situation. Many companies have already um, come up with a strategy that helps them mitigate this problem. Uh, they take that invoice with you know, all those dollars in it and they look very carefully at their consumption. Um, and they say, hmm, that's why it happened. Well, what we need to do then reduce our consumption. Let's just drop it down and uh, we won't be in trouble anymore. The most prevalent way in which they do this is to simply limit 
or ban the use of cloud without direct written permission. Give us a pint of blood, put your firstborn in our office, and we'll let you use cloud for a while. It's, it's very, very challenging. And of course, nothing inhibits innovation like banning the use of resources. So this creates a huge problem for the users and for the departments that are using cloud or want to be using cloud. It also creates a problem for the vendors. You know, if you talk to cloud vendors, the first thing any of them will do is to brag to you about how many subscriptions they're selling every month. Tens of thousands of new subscriptions, month in, month out. It's gangbusters, it's a gold rush, and that's really a smokescreen. Uh, the reality is, this is a consumption-based model. You only pay for what you use. And so when they find out that that's all the users are using, a fraction of what they need to achieve to you know, defray the cost of building their cloud infrastructure and then realize a profit, and then the cloud providers are in trouble too. So when the provider and the customer are both in trouble, clearly it's something we need to address. The fact of the matter is that it pay as you go, which is a benefit of cloud, means that your cloud providers will do, always do everything they can to get you to increase your cloud consumption. They want you to use more. They work very closely with application developers to develop more applications that require more resources to run more workloads, and you get to pay the bill. It increases your costs every time. Something has to be done. So I've broken down the priorities into what I consider to be the two most important categories. Um, the first one is visibility. Visibility is critical to your ability to manage things. For example, you want to see every virtual machine that anybody has spun up anywhere in any of your cloud infrastructure. You have to be able to see every virtual machine because some of them will become zombie VMs. We'll talk more about that later and you want to identify those. You want to be able to identify all workloads that are running, being served, all data assets, and know their valuation so you know where your money is. It's spread around your cloud. You want to be aware of all the users that are on the system at any given time, all the active resources, and even more importantly, all the inactive resources. Net-net, you want to be able to see everything. You want full visibility. And the reason is simple. The reason is if you can't see it, you can't manage it. It's like if you can't measure it, you can't measure it if you can't see it. So if you can't see it, you can't manage it. Okay. You're going to be surprised a little bit by the second of the cloud cost control priorities. It is shopping. Shopping. The second priority is shopping. Why? Well, the first thing I'm going to say is it'll give you many reasons to consider multi-cloud. I mean, multi-cloud has gotten bigger and bigger since it was first introduced a couple of years ago. And, you know, it basically means you're buying cloud services from Amazon, Azure, and Google and others as you need to. Again, one of the main benefits of cloud is that you can mix and match as you want to. You can combine cloud services from various sources. Well, that's as true of these major hyperscaler cloud providers as it is of anybody else. So given that you're going to be shopping, you're going to need to be sure that you can include a financial manager on your cloud management team. You know you need engineers. You know you need technologists. You know you need people who know technology very, very well. Well, you also need somebody who understands how to manage money. Uh, and and there's, the reasons are really simple. Uh, first of all, you want them to constantly be shopping the special promotions that each of these hyperscalers and the smaller clouds all run all the time, but especially the three big ones. 
They change prices constantly, usually downward, to compete with each other. They create special promotions to attract you to them. And some of those promotions are amazing. They're based on your commitment. They're based on time of day. They're based on all kinds of things. Somebody has to be checking to see if they're out there. Because in essence, if they don't, you may have someone come in and say, hey, I hear we're using Amazon for that function, but it's so much less expensive at Azure. What are you doing? Now, you know, you don't want to be a, the one who says, oh, we didn't know. That's kind of a lame excuse. Okay, so those are the two major priorities. Get visibility and make sure that you're capable of shopping, capable of keeping track of what's becoming available to you so that you can take advantage of it at the soonest possible point. But how else do cloud costs get out of control? The first way that I think of is oversubscribing, oversubscribing. And yet I would love to tell you that this is somebody's shoe closet who has oversubscribed to shoes. Uh, obviously, it's a shoe store. But oversubscribing kind of leads back to the old days when you would go out to buy servers and storage for your on-premises network. When you bought storage, you'd say, OK, well, we're currently storing two megabytes of data. And last year it was about one. So we're increasing by a year. We need at least three years of, of projection, but I think we're gonna accelerate. So not five terabytes, let's include eight terabytes of storage in our configuration. Here's the problem with that. If you are indeed currently storing two terabytes and you move that all into new storage, uh, you have six more terabytes that are sitting there from day one that you've paid for or are paying for on a lease and you're not using them. They're sitting there idle. If you're keeping your current storage in the current equipment that you use, that's eight terabytes that are sitting there completely unused from day one. Maybe a year later it's seven and then a year later it's six or five. But throughout the life of that equipment, a big chunk of it is completely unused. Now, that's not the case in cloud. In cloud, if you're using two terabytes, then you subscribe for two terabytes. If you need another, then you request another terabyte or half a terabyte. Uh, if you suddenly have a mammoth project and you need more, you order up three more. And then when you're done with them, you release them, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, as we've just pointed out, some people just don't. So it's not necessary anymore to order up eight terabytes from the get-go. Order up what you need and add more as you go. Another way in which we encourage or create more cost is cloud sprawl. This is the um, downside of how easy it is to spin up servers in the cloud. Again, it used to be on premises, you'd have to order a server. It would take a while to be purchased. It would take a while to come in. It would take a while for them to install it, integrate it into the network. You're talking about weeks. Now you go to your self-service portal and request another server. And here's the storage I want, the memory I want. Here's the processor I want. Here's the operating system, the database. And instantly, you have a new VM. Well, anything is that easy to do is that easy to do frequently. And that's exactly what happens. It becomes so easy to do that it becomes reflexive. People just do it by reflex. They just say, OK, let, let's spin up another server for that and let's take a look at that. And then, of course, they move on and they don't shut that VM down. And they don't shut that VM down and that VM and that VM. They keep on adding more VMs. You end up with cloud sprawl. You have all these VMs out there doing absolutely nothing. Another cause of increased cost is shadow IT. Um, shadow IT, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, uh, I envy you. Uh, but um, it simply means that one of your departmental managers, 
uh, has a request for an application sitting in IT, waiting on the stack to be uh, the next one to be uh, produced. Uh, sometimes that stack gets pretty deep and there's a period of delay. Managers are in part promoted to manager because of their impatience. Uh, they're supposed to be impatient and want to get things done faster. Unfortunately, some of them don't um, obey the rules all the time. And so they go out and they subscribe to their own cloud services. They don't need you. They'll just do it themselves. And suddenly, at some given point, you see a whole new cloud service out there on your network. You don't know where it came from. You had nothing to do with it. It doesn't necessarily conform to all your standards. And so maybe it's not really secure, um, but you're paying for it. It's, 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 it's exhausting your budget. Um, this happens too frequently and it becomes overwhelming. And so you need to get that to stop. And unfortunately to date, most IT managers, or not most, let's just say many, um, their idea of inhibiting shadow IT is to give the um, violating manager a hard time, uh, as hard a time as they possibly can, uh, making their life miserable if they can. And nothing is less effective. The reality is managers, many, many managers have found that the, the only way to successfully inhibit shadow IT is to work with those departmental managers, partner with them, communicate with them, encourage them to find more innovative ways. Um, lately, we're seeing the rise of uh, citizen development to help the developers get the project started. Uh, all of that driven in part by the existence of shadow IT. So if we can get rid of shadow IT or reduce it at least, we can reduce our overall cost of cloud compute. Then of course, uh, one of the fun ones, the zombie assets. What's a zombie asset? Simple, um, something you've requested, you finished using and you haven't released. It's sitting out there. As I said before, the meter is running and you are paying for every nanosecond that that resource sits out there unused. Um, the degree to which zombie assets are populating cloud networks is often frightening. Frightening. You've got to hunt these zombies down and you've got to drive a stake through their hearts. Um, you've got to get rid of those zombie assets. You've got to, nothing, there, there is no, easier way to dramatically reduce your overall spend than to simply go out there and hunt down the zombie assets and get rid of them. So how do you solve that? How do you go out and hunt for them? How do you resolve them? And, 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 and even more to the point, who? Who is going to solve that? Is it only going to be the IT department? Um, I don't think so. Um, the fact is, I think that it takes just about everybody. When you have users who are continuously conscious of the way in which they manage their use of the cloud, that in and of itself will reduce your cloud spend because there won't be as many zombie assets. If, if the zombie assets never start, you never pay for them. So the closer you can get to that, the better off you are. And the reality is that it is just a function of getting a culture going in your company where everybody knows that when you're done with an asset or when you're done with a resource, you release it right away because you're spending company money to do that. Um, so how do you get everybody on the same page and how do you get everybody to participate with you in bringing those costs down? And to suggest that, let's start at the beginning. The beginning is policy. And I can't emphasize this enough. Most, not again, I did it most. Let's say many 
many people who are approaching using cloud or any other technology don't begin with policy. I'm sorry, any, any technology initiative, they don't begin with policy. They begin kind of organically like, oh, let's do that. Okay, we need this and let's do that and let's do that. But there's no policy involved. The best example I can think of is a firewall. Firewall is supposed to help you enforce your security policy. If you have no security policy, there's nothing to enforce. Therefore, you don't need a firewall. And of course, you know you do need a firewall. But to make it useful, it has to have a policy to protect. And so starting with policy is job one. To create your policy, one thing you should be aware of is that there are cloud-based governance tools to help you develop your policies. There are many of them. We'll talk about how to find them and evaluate them a little bit later. But be aware that there are wonderful cloud-based governance tools that can give you examples, and can walk you through the process, help you determine which policies you need to have in place, how to create them, how to apply them to your company, and how to get them distributed out to where they'll do the most good, your user community. Also, there are great tools to help you track cloud usage and costs. And that tracking will help you determine whether or not your policies are being followed. So also important to have a platform that uses as much automation as possible to track cloud usage and your costs. That another function of the system should be to alert you when somebody has gone past their quota. Um, you know, you can set thresholds for how many VMs can be spun up uh, or how much resource can be assigned to VMs. Um, you should definitely have that in place. And when those thresholds are exceeded, you're alerted in many different ways. Um, one of the things you can do is work with your operational hours. Um, if you are a single shift business that operates during normal business hours, nine to five ish, um, you can protect yourself by shutting down everything after hours. Most businesses these days are not single shift. They're usually three shift, meaning 24 hours a day. Um, you can still use uh, the cloud services pricing programs to move your utilization to times that are less expensive. Each of the cloud providers has downtime pricing so that you know, one to five in the morning may be less expensive than one to five in the afternoon. You can take advantage of that. Here's the, the zombie VM thing. You need to be monitoring for idle resources, resources that have been disassociated, um, volumes that are just sitting there, um, or VMs that have been spinning for more than a set number of days. You know, get past the threshold, you at very least check in with the department or the user to make sure they still need that resource. And then you remove any that are now unused or underutilized. By the way, before you do that, you should notify the user. Make sure they know because they may simply be distracted and they may still need that resource. Be sure that you have a process built in to check with them first. Um, when you order up a VM, you're typically indicating the capacities that you want in that VM. And one way to avoid unnecessary cost is to size them properly. Uh, the, the proper size is really a balance between the performance you want and the cost you don't want to exceed. You have to balance performance against cost. Um, and depending on the workload, depending on, depending on the objectives, there's you know, a lot of elements in the decision, but try to come up with a methodology for right-sizing each of those resources as an ideal balance between performance and cost. Then you can use policies to terminate servers created to temporarily handle what become massive workloads. There again, policy serves you. The next area in which you can implement 
with strategies for reducing cost is in the solution design itself. Starting with the assignment and allocation of workloads, where are they going to go? Um, and, and really, this refers to what's referred to as leveling your storage. You're going to have workloads that you use constantly. Some of them are very transactional. Uh, some of them house documents that are used all the time. It, it really varies from business to business. But those that you need to access quickly, regularly, you're going to put into higher priced, higher speed storage, storage that can get the data back to you very rapidly. Whereas you're going to archive data that you seldom if ever use. And that can be archived in very low cost, slow storage. You know, so you don't want to find a file in high priced, you know, high velocity storage that hasn't been used in two years. That's embarrassing. So you need to ask yourself questions. Does this workload require a specific cloud platform? Now that goes beyond uh, cost. That goes to, there are some applications that simply require you to use Amazon or Azure, Google, IBM, or others. Um, and so you may have to use a specific cloud provider for applications. There's a difference between you have to, and you want to use the cloud platform that best supports your application. If it can run on anything, you have to determine where it's going to run best. Best meaning the most ideal balance between performance and cost, as we just said. Will any specific platform run each workload Aha, more cost effectively? So best is performance and cost. Well, which one is most cost effective? More and more now, you're going to need to be able to accommodate container requirements. Most of you are probably very aware of uh, cloud native software. With cloud native architecture, we've replaced the huge blocks of code that applications used to be, and we've replaced them by dissolving them down into individual microservices. So all the microservices that formerly were part of that big block are now individual and they are loaded into containers along with all the resources they need to run. And when they're needed, they're called up. At the point in which they're called up, they're instantiated. They, trans they trans transit the network very, very fast. They get to where they need to be, and they are submitted to runtime for execution. Fantastic. You need to support that. You need to have the storage, the processing, uh, the network. Uh, you need management platforms. You, know, you may need Kubernetes. You may need uh, Docker. You may need a lot of other products that you know, are, are popular in the container environment. But you need to be prepared, and you need to be prepared to, to, to secure those containers as they do all that traveling. You can anticipate hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of containers flying across your network simultaneously. You've got to be able to manage all that. You've got to be able to secure all that. So that is a discussion unto itself. Ultimately, you need to be able to determine which service is the best service for your workload no matter what it is the workload needs. Now, the, the right cloud service is the cloud service that does what you need done best. Be careful. Each of the cloud providers may all have a service of the same name, but the service name on each of the different providers is really a different service from each other. They're completely different from each other. They do not describe a similar service even though they're using the same name. So you have to really look hard at the service itself to determine whether or not it's what you think it is and whether it provides the best possible uh, efficiency to what you need done. You're going to have to interrogate those services very deeply and evaluate them very carefully for performance and cost. 
From there, you can start to build your resource projections so that you can start to anticipate how much you're going to need going ahead. When you're in the development stage, it's not going to be much, but then you're going to get to user acceptance testing. It's going to be more. And then even when you start to give it to the ops group to roll out, they're going to start with a pilot and that's going to be a fairly small set of resources. And then that small set's going to get big as they get to the general rollout. So you need to begin an ongoing process of forecasting utilization. And that process will change over time, but you need to stay with it because that's the only way you're going to be controlling your costs long term. So when you design a, a solution, when you design a new workload, define and allocate the budget for it as part of that design process. Use chargebacks. Once you're in ops, once you're in production, identify and allocate the cost of each operation to the department that it comes out of. You know, workloads and applications are used by specific departments. You need to measure how much resource each one uses and assign it back to that department so they see how much they're spending and so you see how much they're spending and how your financial officers see how much they're spending. Uh, there are some processes that will be cost centers that will have no offsetting profit coming back. You need to identify those as well. With departments, you can usually do a balance sheet, do a pro forma that shows how much it's costing and how much it's generating. Cost centers, not so much. And not only do you want to do this at the department level, you want to do it even more granularly. You want to identify projects that are spending, teams that are spending, and even individuals that you, know, you may have somebody spinning up VMs willy-nilly all day long. You need to talk to that person. You need to know who they are. Uh, and of course, you need to establish approval procedures. Now, I'm not saying deny or limit. I'm saying make sure everybody knows that if you utilize more than this much resource, we're going to sit down and talk. There's a wonderful um, concept called Heiselberg's uncertainty principle, which suggests that the fact that something is being measured affects the thing being measured. In the case here is if people know that you're watching how much they're spending, they'll exert more careful control over what they're spending. Um, to help them, you want to give them alerts whenever they're exceeding their thresholds or even when they're getting close to their thresholds. You're going to charge them back. They, they need to know that. Um, so their budget's going to be impacted by how much cloud resource they use. You're going to want to use showback reports. So before they get charged, they know what they're going to be charged for. Um, and you may be able to include some projections in there to warn them to back off if necessary. Um, but your goal, and it should be everybody's goal, right, is to make sure the benefit exceeds the cost. Um, that's how you generate profits. And so from solutions design standpoint, these are a lot of good things to think about. Even the procurement department uh, should be involved in the process. Um, Multi-cloud in particular, if you're gonna use multi-cloud as a strategy, you need specialists. Not only do you need a specialist in how to purchase these things, you need specialists in each cloud provider's functions um, who understand each cloud so that they can discuss compare and contrast and decide which cloud platform to use. It's hard to believe that any one technologist could really master all the hypervisors with all the services and all the configuration standards. There's just tonnage of information, idiosyncrasies. Um, better to have a focused person for each if you can. Um, people who know also the financial side, the reserved instance discounts, for example, all the different pricing programs that may come or are coming. Uh, again, you have to know not only the technology side, you also need to know the financial side. And indeed, the best engineers I've ever worked with 
were able to consult with their customers, not only on the best, most effective design, but also the best, most effective way to purchase what was needed for the design. Used to be software licenses, now it's cloud seats, uh, maybe hardware, other services. So it's just, just as important to consult on the financial side as it is on the technology side. Um, you may be able to reduce costs by using brokers or aggregators, people who buy up a huge chunk of cloud services from the providers and then parcel it out through sub agents or sub sales organizations to various smaller customers who take a piece of it. This is a direct lift from the way telecom works. Uh, and they've been doing it that way for years. There are master agents who make the commitment to the big carriers. And then there are sub agents who buy that capacity from the master agents and sell it to their customers. They basically leverage the master agents big discount. You want to also be sure you standardize your procurement procedures. You don't want uh, people using various different methodologies. This happens more when you decentralize than when you remain centralized. And I'm a big advocate, especially with cloud, uh, for having a centralized management body. Uh, you need to manage your reserved instances. If you're going to reserve them, that means you're making a commitment. You have to make sure that you are utilizing and leveraging those commitments. Remember, the only levers you have for reducing cost are to find reduced rates from the different cloud providers and to do everything you can to minimize your own consumption, your own utilization of cloud resources. Once they're procured, provisioning them is a place in which you can help. Remember that when you're talking about your DevOps team, the DevOps team is committed to achieving continuous improvement through continuous deployment. Achieving continuous deployment means you got to move very quickly. They are dependent upon the, the ability to move very fast from development to deployment, to feedback, to redevelopment, and oh, again and again and again and again. Do the best you can to keep as much um, limitation off them so that they can move very quickly without having to stop for red tape. Um, this is an environment in which you don't want to incur delay. And uh, it's part of what makes DevOps successful. Um, and again, I mentioned it earlier, decentralized teams may come up with all kinds of crazy ways to do things that you have to figure out and in some cases resolve. Um, let that be centralized, or at the very least, um, establishing your policies, very specific provisioning policies, so that people use them. Uh, there are stack templates that are available from the cloud providers to help you uh, determine the best possible configuration for every VM, for everything that you use. Definitely recommended that you start from these templates uh, to give you a foundation that you can quickly embark from. Um, and again, your processes will be, uh, your processes must be aligned with what the department users need. And at the same time, um, they need to be designed for your company's need to reduce costs. That's a magic balance too. And this ensures that only specific resources are provisioned and not resources that are going to be wasteful. Finally, I'll revisit visibility very quickly because we're starting to run short on time. Uh, methods that are used to um, view cloud costs vary from organization to organization. A recent survey showed that there are actually 11% of organizations surveyed who accept that they don't have much visibility. Fully a third of them choose to trust the cloud providers. And I'm sorry, but usually the cloud providers reports perfectly match their invoice. And I just need to have some other assurance that it's all accurate. Um, 
Some are now still manually extracting the cost information from the database and putting it into a spreadsheet to massage. Nothing is more time consuming, more, you know, work, you know, work late. And then um, the other 20% um, to round it out, use third party tools to aggregate and report all those costs. It's an automated process so you can see the information far faster. And I anticipate that this table will change over the next year or so, so that there are very small numbers in the first three and the last one is the big one. There are great third party platforms and tools out there to help you to manage and report on all costs. You know, get out there, find them, evaluate them, and you'll be doing yourself a huge favor. Also use tagging. Uh, you don't need a lot of tags, but you need meaningful tags so that you can determine what resources are being used for what. Most and I, again, I apologize for rushing through, but you know, you want to define your strategy for using tags and then you want to live that strategy. And then you want to report out on what the tags tell you so that people out who are using benefit from the information gathered from the tags. If you don't do that, there's no point in tagging. So make sure that the information gets back to the users where it can be put to uh, good use and be sure to implement automation wherever and whenever you can. You need to determine who needs visibility into what. Not everybody needs visibility into everything. You need to track your cloud spend against budgets, which means you have to have budgets in the first place. You need to gain visibility into the different costs from the different cloud providers, preferably in one place where you can compare and contrast them to determine where you're spending most effectively and which cloud provider is cooperating most effectively. Um, and again, real-time alerts. Whenever any budget is being exceeded, you wanna know it because the faster you can respond to it, the better you can do. Centralize your view of all cloud costs the way you centralize your control of all cloud provisioning and, and control. Um, again, as we said before, you know, a good central view by department, by the teams of the department, by the project they're doing, even by the individual users is always uh, advisable and make use of cost analytics. There are some great analytic products out there now that can help you really interrogate what you're doing in your cloud environment and suggest ways in which you may be able to improve it. The most prevalent of which, of course, is the classic chargeback and showback. Um, the departments need to know how much they've spent. It needs to come out of their budget, just the way it comes out of yours. And that depends completely upon having real-time reporting and also real-time dashboards that you can interrogate quickly and drill down into to answer your questions. Uh, speed is of the essence. It'll always be of the essence. In management and control, your best cloud management systems will use RBAC. You know, imagine trying to update the, uh, the, the rights of 10,000 users versus seven different roles that those 10,000 users occupy. I'd rather do seven than 10,000 any day. Um, you have to clearly define from policy forward uh, what the permissions are, how each user can access. You need to limit the data and the actions that are visible to users. You don't want necessarily users seeing anything that they can't impact. Um, again, what they do? what VMs were launched, when were they um, released, uh, how well did people take corrective actions to control costs. Celebrate your champions. Those who are really doing a great job, make them very visible to everybody. You know, real-time visibility extends to them as well as to what's going on across your cloud environment. Make sure that you're always leveling your storage. Make sure that you're supporting the consumption decisions with where you're leveling your supportage, your storage, excuse me. And that will, you know, that will come from visibility of all the services that are used, who's using them to what purpose and at what cost. This information will enable you to optimize not only the performance, but also the cost of your cloud environment. 
Multi-cloud is not a trivial decision. Yes, it demands constant oversight. Uh, there's lots of different instances. There's lots of different uh, standards, lots of different idiosyncrasies. Um, they define things in different ways, security protocols. It's a lot. Um, but if you configure your team right, it can be incredibly beneficial. And always use automated tools as much as possible um, because having people do this kind of work is actually more expensive than using automation. The automation should feed the information to the humans who need to know about it so that they can do the things that need to be done. Most important, don't do this alone. You know, if you're doing a, a cloud deployment for the first time, you're only going to do it once and maybe then other things down the road. There are companies and firms that what <laughs> new is what they do for a living. Um, and rolling out cloud uh, implementations, that's their stock and trade. Find them, evaluate them, select one that you know you can trust and work with them, you know, benefit from their experience because that's what really makes the difference between knowing the rules and living the rules and understanding the rules. So finally, in closing, key takeaways. Uh, cloud services is a larger process than you anticipate it's going to be. It just is. Um, even if you know that you saw the service you want on a list, that doesn't mean it's the service you really want. Make sure you get the definition of that service from that service provider. Um, there are different uh, VM configurations available from each of the providers. Some provide different databases, some provide different OSs, some configure for high velocity, some for high volume. Um, it varies widely. You need to study all of the cloud providers to determine which one has the, the best, least cost, solutions to what you want to do. Um, and again, you know, different operating systems and databases. If your workload requires a specific database that two of the three big cloud providers don't, don't support, your decision just became simple. Remember also that costs and capacities are constantly changing. Pricing is constantly changing. Each of the cloud providers is competing constantly with their competitors. And so they're improving everything all the time. The good news is that as things get better, costs are coming down because of that competition. So you're benefiting. Of course, to take fullest advantage of it, you must keep track of it. And finally, let's acknowledge that's not easy. It takes a village. It takes a good team to do that. With that, I'm going to turn back to Jess and see if we've generated any questions. Hey, Howard. Yeah. Uh, first, I have to start by saying thank you so much uh, for that presentation. I, I, was, um, I feel like we could do a 20-minute discussion on every single one of your slides and, and still mm -hmm. probably not cover everything that was in there. Um, I, I definitely want to do an entire webinar just on zombie hunting. That just sounds like fun. So let's, <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> Uh, but I, you know, and even some really sort of deceptively simple things. Um, and you just said right at the end there, you know, it's not easy. And, and where you were talking about reducing costs or reducing your consumption, really being the only ways, uh, that you can, that you can manage this bottom line. And I think that's such a, sorry, I'm just watching the slides flicker. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to get back to the takeaways, but I can't seem to get the bullets to come out. Oh, let me, let me, let's see. Let me jump in. Yeah. There we it. go. You got it. You got it. Yes. Great team effort. I'm around it. Um, and I want I to. I, I, for, yes. Right. See, it's not easy. It's not. E I make it look easy, Howard, but it's not easy. Um, <laughs> um, I know we're right, right at the top of the hour and the end of time. And I know some folks are going to have to leave us. Um, but I do. I just want to try to kind of sneak in. Luckily, you actually answered quite a few of the questions. There's a few more that I'm going to make sure that you get uh, so that, you know, you're, you're able to follow up with these folks if uh, if you've got the time, Howard. But um, I, you know, so it's not easy. Um, and and there are a lot of barriers and obstacles, some of which are mental and some of which are, are 
other members of our team. Um, so before we kind of go, if there's any last thought on, you know, what what are the main obstacles that you see kind of facing anyone who's in our audience today that is looking to take some of these steps? And then, you know, sort of a main takeaway. And I know obviously these are more nuanced questions than we have time to dig into. But, you know, if there's one sort of way that you think that they can uh, start addressing those obstacles preemptively, you know, what would you what would you want them to take away? Uh, I, I think that, um, see, I'm just, I'm just putting back up my, uh, my contact info. So anybody who wants to, um, email yes. me with questions again, uh, uh, <laughs> there, we go. there we go. Sorry. Um, if you want to reach out to me directly, there's my email address. Uh, please feel free. Um, I love talking tech with anybody, everybody all the time. I learn a whole lot from the questions. Um, the biggest takeaway, I guess, is that you really need, in some cases, to um, uh, suppress human nature. Mm. Uh, human nature is to move as fast as you possibly can to get done what you need to get done. And uh, in many cases, costs be damned. Uh, this is not an environment where costs can be damned because they get enormous very, very quickly. They get out of control very easily. You need to go in a logical se sequence that starts with planning. And even before planning starts with discovery. You need to know that you know your current state and know your current state well. Then you can start to plan your future state and you need you can you know start to think about what's going to be needed, where is it going to be needed, when, by whom, um, and 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 that has to be done in tremendous detail. It's worth the time you invest up front because then you won't have to spend even more time. You know, there's always time. There's never time to do it right, but there's always time to do it over. That doesn't fly here. It doesn't fly here. You have to do it right the first time to serve yourself. And that means, you know, your natural, you know, your natural uh, proclivity to rush really has to be suppressed. And most successful cloud implementations have really been initiated by very, very patient people. I love that. Yes. And I, I think a lot of us are guilty of that wanting to, to rush to the exciting part, the implementation, mm -hmm. or rush to the, you know, the nice part, the comfort on the other side. Um, and, uh, and, you know, you mentioned, uh, briefly, and, and I'm going to just echo this, especially because this is something that you do exceptionally well, um, but the importance of consulting, uh, with an expert. So if, if you have a cloud expert on your team, great. Um, if you want to bring in an outside consultant, I think that is, is something that a lot of people, um, assume we were talking about this earlier that, that, uh, you know, they don't want to spend the money on that, uh, similarly to not wanting to spend the time. And, uh, and then it can you know, end up costing a lot more time and money. One, one, of, one of the most overused um, uh, statements in, in, in IT is that um, people don't appreciate the difference between price and cost. Um, mm. Price is what you spend up front. And if you spend the right amount up front, your TCO, your total cost of ownership over time, will be lower, lots lower. So it's worth spend making the investment up front in somebody who can help you get there faster. First of all, you get better time to value when mm -hmm. you do it that way. Second of all, you don't spend as much time remediating the things you missed. Um, and I've proven time after time again, uh, people tell me to sharpen my pencil. Uh, when I'm quoting, I tell them, sharpen your pencil when you're planning. Um, and then you won't have to worry about me. Um, and it's, it's just true. The more planning you do, the less remediating. You know, people complain. I'm sure everybody who's sitting out there listening has at one time or another complained that they constantly are playing firemen, you know, putting out fires. Let me tell you, the more planning you do, the fewer fires you'll get. Hmm. I, yes. Um, boy, I keep watching this clock tick and I, I just don't want to wrap this up. I'm, I'm going to be a really terrible moderator right now and ask you one last little question, um, which we may or may not mm -hmm. 
actually have time to answer. Uh, so you let me know. We did get a lot of questions about communication. In fact, there was one great example that came in from Laura um, talking about, you know, you know, back in the day feeling like she was the hero and she was enabling everyone in IT and now, you know, in security feeling like she's saying no all the time. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of some ill will sometimes on teams uh, towards IT and, and the folks that are concerned about uh, security and restrictions. Yep. Um, there's also a couple of questions about communicating to your leaders and the value of these things. So if if there's any, if there's sort of a shorthand advice, and obviously some of this, I think, is follow up with Howard after we wrap today. Um, but is there any kind of one piece of advice in terms of communication planning that you want to revisit before we wrap today? Sure. There, actually, there are two, one for your leadership and one for your users. Uh, with your leadership, always remember to frame everything you're proposing or everything you're discussing in terms of benefit to the company. And benefit, you know, we learned long ago that benefit is something you can deposit in your bank account. Um, results are something you can deposit in your bank account. Your senior management is worried about keeping costs low and keeping sales high because those are the only two ways to increase profit. And so you need to, you know, you're going to need to sell your ideas. And the easiest way to sell your ideas is to connect them to higher profit. When it comes to users, recognize that every user doesn't know it necessarily, but they're looking for their own digital transformation. They are looking for technology to make things easier for them um, mm -hmm. and faster and, and less impactful and more fulfilling. They're looking for that. They are people. And the <laughs> can't express um, strongly enough the, the importance of hum the human element in computing. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, the last component of the, of the chain of your network is the user. Uh, if you take the time to explain things to them, circulate a newsletter that explains why you're doing some of the things you're doing. Spend the time to sit down and consult with a department about why their last idea just can't really be done um, practically and how we can perhaps do it another way. The more IT includes itself in the community that is their company or organization, the easier it will be. Remember, users only know that there is a problem. They don't know where it's coming from. Uh, they think, oh, the network is slow, but it might just be their PC. It right. doesn't matter what's causing it. It's blamed on IT. <laughs> That's it. You get to blame no matter what. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, do yourself a favor, communicate more. And those are other fires that you'll stop putting out. Hmm. Oh, I love that. Okay, Howard, I unfortunately am going to have to stop us there. I apologize uh, to everyone for keeping you all a bit late, Howard included, but this was just so fascinating. I couldn't resist a few questions. Um, and Howard, thank you so much for putting up your contact info. I hope everyone out there who we didn't get to your questions uh, will follow up with Howard and we will make sure to pass on the questions we have here as well. Uh, once again, Howard, thank you so much for being here to, to talk to us today. This has been well, absolutely fascinating. Thank, thank you, too, Jess, and thank you everybody for, for hanging in with us. <laughs> yeah. I think they all got a lot out of it. Well, Howard, I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too. And everybody out there, uh, we are going to get into a prize drawing uh, in just a moment here. But since I know some of you are going to drop off the second I say the name, um, I'm going to switch, uh, uh, jump ahead a little bit in what I'd hope to say to you all today, because I do really want to make sure before you start signing out um, that I say a, a very special end of the season and, and thank you to everyone out there in our audience. This is one of the last webinars that we're running uh, before we wrap up for some uh, much needed and well-deserved rest. Uh, and, uh, and before we kind of head out for the holidays, and this is actually my last webinar, uh, of the week here. Uh, I want to, you know, once again, and just absolutely from the bottom of my heart, tell you all how much it means to everyone here on the actual tech media team that you all take time out of your days to come and join in these conversations with us. Um, it, it makes a, a huge difference uh, to see your engagement, see your questions, 
uh, as I said, we we recognize names. We we see you all. Uh, well, I promise you, we, we're not seeing you, but we see your names and your highs and hellos. Um, and it it really does feel like we're part of a community, and that means a lot to us. So, just wanted to make sure that I said that uh, before I I give this prize away and and start to see those uh, attendance numbers tick down. Uh, but I will I will stop talking now and give you a, a three hundred dollar Amazon gift card. We're going to give that away to someone here in the audience. Again, if you're interested in prize T's and C's, those are in the uh, handouts tab for you. Okay, today's winner of a $300 Amazon gift card is Corey Halichick from Texas. Corey Halichick from Texas. Congratulations to Corey. We will follow up with you after the webinar. Uh, and with that, and on behalf of the actual tech media team, I, I really want to thank Cloud Zero, Cisco, Do It, and Immersive Labs for making this webinar possible. A giant thank you to Howard for a truly engaging discussion. I see a lot of uh, high fives and, and appreciation coming out for Howard. I have to echo that. Absolutely fascinating. Um, and as always, uh, sending some big thanks to all of you for attending and asking those questions. I know that a lot of us are feeling time starved right now, uh, and it really does mean a lot to us that you choose to spend your time with us. Uh, and as I mentioned, we really do feel like you're part of you're part of our team. So Scott, David, and I, on behalf of the actual tech media team, we want to say a very warm thank you and wish you all the best, whatever you're doing on break, if you're vacationing, uh, taking those holidays, celebrating with family, maybe you're catching up on work, you're skiing, you're sitting on a tropical beach, whatever it is that you've got coming these next days and weeks, uh, genuinely and truthfully, I want to thank you all for being a part of our lives here at Actual Tech Media, and I cannot wait to see you all again in the new year. And until then, have an absolutely wonderful wrap to 2022.